Let's see. Let me go in the back. That's so right there. No, not the sunglasses on the head, the guy in front of me. I'll get to you. I was going to ask, uh, what do you think is your potential path to victory if these things, are, these things go best case? And what's your path to everyone kid can believe in it and follow that? Sure. And the other question is, do you think Donald Trump has a good heart? Because he was talking about a civil war on Tucker, and he didn't, he didn't resist that thought. He was almost encouraging. So, yeah, that's my question. I'm tempted to answer the second part first but I'll restrain myself and give you my path to victory first. Look, the path to victory starts here. And let me tell you something. Remember 2008. John McCain was dead in the water. He had fired his entire campaign staff. He had nobody left working for him except for two people who drove him around New Hampshire in a suburban. Mitt Romney was the neighboring governor. Personally wealthy, spending a ton of money. Rudy Giuliani, it's hard to remember back this far, but was America's mayor, who had enormous respect for people all over the country. John McCain was dead. And he won New Hampshire and never lost again. New Hampshire creates momentum. Momentum creates wins. South Carolina did it four years ago for Joe Biden. Joe Biden lost to Iowa and lost to New Hampshire. They all said Joe Biden was dead. Then he won South Carolina by a lot. He was winning states on Super Tuesday that he literally had never visited and had no campaign personnel working. That's American politics. When you show you can win, people want to be with the winner. And they're like, let's go. And there, I think there's a lot of people in our party who are saying they're for Trump right now because they're like, well... He's probably going to win. So I guess I should be with the guy who's going to win. I don't want Biden, so I'm not thrilled about it, but I'm going to be for Trump. The minute you show the emperor has no clothes, I, I am willing to bet you there is going to be a mad rush for the exits from the Red Hat crowd. Who are going to say, you know what? Thank you very much, but you look like you can win. We need to beat Biden and we need someone who can. And I'm going to pick the guy who just beat you. So that's the path to victory. Do I think he has a good heart? I think he used to. When I first met him back in 2001, I think he had a good heart. I, I think that the years have taken whatever good heart he had and taken it away from him. And I don't think he's got it anymore. I think all he cares about now is himself. And I saw that happening when he was in the White House. In the beginning, when he first became president, he was scared to death. I remember Mary Pat and I went to see him. It was 11, 25 days into his presidency. He invited the two of us to come down for lunch, and we had lunch in the Oval Office, with, right off the Oval Office with him. And the first thing he said to me when I walked into the Oval Office was, he goes, Chris, can you believe I'm here? <laughs> he was petrified. But as time went on, and in that job, people kiss your rear end a lot, I've heard. And um, I think he, it all became about him. And that's why I brought up I Am Your Retribution. Because it tells you what he's focused on now. He feels that he was wrong. And in some ways he was. Look, though, I said from the beginning the whole Russia investigation was a pile of crap. I was in that campaign. That campaign couldn't have organized a two-car funeral, everybody. I was there. They had nobody who knew what they were doing. They had a really charismatic candidate and a really awful opponent in Hillary Clinton. The idea that the Trump campaign could have put together a conspiracy with the Russian government to influence the election, Mary Penn and I would talk about it. It was laugh out loud. Are you kidding? They couldn't conspire with each other, let alone conspire with Vladimir Putin. And I think that affected him. That two years of pounding embittered him. And instead of rising above it, he decided, I'm going to be one of them. And he said it the other night. He said, if I become president and there's somebody who opposes me, I'm going to tell my attorney general to indict them. Like, is, 
that really where we want to go, everybody? And if you think that that's what Joe Biden has done again, if you believe that, and you're offended by it, and opposed to it, as you should be, why the hell would you let him do it? He's telling you he's going to do it. He's lost his way. Power corrupted him. And made him an angry, bitter man. And all you need to do is listen to him. Don't take my word for it. Just listen. Listen to his interview from Sunday. He's an angry, bitter man. And I would argue to you that we don't need an angry, bitter man as President of the United States. You know, my first vote was in 1980. I turned 18 in September, the election was in November. I sat in my dorm room at the University of Delaware. And it was not a happy time, as you all remember. Double-digit inflation, double-digit unemployment, double-digit interest rates, and you're a new college student go, wow, great world I'm going into. I will ever be able to afford to buy a house. I will ever be able to afford to buy a car. I won't be able to find a job. What am I doing? And I was taking on debt to go to college because my family didn't have the money to send me. So I had to borrow the money to do it. And I sat in my dorm room and got my absentee ballot. And I voted for the first time in my life. And I voted for Ronald Reagan. And the reason I voted for him was because he gave me hope. He made me believe, despite all the bad stuff that was happening around me, that he had a plan and the character to execute that plan to make the country a better place. And he did. I don't think we need people who are in it for themselves, seeking retribution. I think we need people who believe in America and its people. I do. And that's the other part of the path to victory is I've won and I've lost. Winning is much better. <laughs> much, much better. But losing didn't make me stop coming up here eight years later. But I felt like my country, when I looked at this race, very proud, I said, no one's going to take him on. No one is going to take him on. They're all going to cuddle up next to him. And if you need any further proof of this, just remember the debate from three weeks ago. The question we got to ask is, would you support a convicted felon for President of the United States? And six of those people raised their hand. The Santa like, if you looked at what everybody else did, it was like the kid who used to copy off your paper in class, right? So, and the multiple choices, he's got B, he's got B, okay, B. So you know, one way people raise their hand, the other way, okay, I'll put my hand up, right? So I don't know if he's convicted on that, on that answer, but he raised his hand. I refuse to raise my hand like a boot for it. Let me tell you. To be president of the United States, the only two things the Constitution requires is to be 35 years old and be a natural born citizen of the United States. I'm sure if Ben Franklin, Thomas Jefferson, John Adams, and George Washington thought that anybody would ever have the audacity as a convicted criminal to work for president of the United States, they would have also put in there and not been convicted of a federal crime. But they never thought anybody would have the gall to actually offer themselves for the presidency after being convicted of a federal crime. One of the few criticisms of the founders. But we can change that. And I am proud of the fact that I didn't raise my hand, and I will never raise my hand to say that someone who has been convicted by a jury of their peers in the fairest justice system that exists in the world, not perfect, but the fairest justice system that exists in the world, so it should be President of the United States? No chance. And I suggest you should touch all those other people.